Everyone lives in a tidy, warm house, has plenty of good food and fuel, with whole clothes from head to feet. The manufacturer, perhaps, of his own family. A view through rose-colored glasses? Perhaps. But to an immigrant from the lower classes of European society, life in the middle American colonies must have seemed like paradise enough. New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and Delaware, with their fertile river valleys and flourishing towns, supported a population explosion. People of different social and ethnic backgrounds were able to benefit from the fertility of the land, as well as the relative tolerance of the middle colonies. This is why they became known not only as the breadbasket of North America, but also the best poor man's country in the world at that time. a peculiar notion about the Dutch uh, in our popular culture. We tend to think of them as uh, people who go around sticking fingers in dikes and wearing wooden shoes. Uh, but in fact, the Dutch were no shrinking tulips in the 16th century. They were, in essence, an internal colony of Spain. And in the 1580s, they declared their independence and they embarked on what was going to be an 80-year war of independence. But the way they did it was uh, not to directly attack Spain, because Spain was in fact far too powerful, but what they did was they went to the outer limits of Spain's empire. New Amsterdam was at the very outer penumbra. So it was a great place from which to make a, a, an imperial struggle uh, effective. And they had two missions. One, attack the Spanish to make a lot of money. Uh, and they managed to conjoin those things, partly by ripping off Spanish uh, treasure fleets and, uh, and, and the like. By the 1640s, the Dutch Empire had begun to peak, and in an odd way, it, that peak was reached when they finally won independence from Spain in 1648. And by signing that treaty, they meant they were not allowed to, in fact, continue to attack the Spanish, and that was a big source of their income. So the empire hits its height uh, in the late 1640s and begins to decline. And it's at just that time that they say, you know, New Amsterdam was this kind of backwater area before, but now actually looks good. Maybe we should think about fixing this place up. And they send Peter Stuyvesant, and he's sent in with a mission, you know, like Marshall Dillon, this is Dodge City, and we want you to clean up this town. He builds up the church, uh, he builds up the, uh, the school, lays out roads, fixes up the docks. Terrific. He gets this place all spiffed into shape. The second thing that he does is he comes up with a rationale for how this can be a real profit center for the, uh, the Dutch. And in a word, the answer is slavery. And the vision is that New Amsterdam will be a depot, a transfer point uh, for slaves coming in. Uh, we tend, in fact, to be amazed for some reason when we think about uh, New York uh, City uh, as being a slave society. But of course, in fact, it was uh, from this very moment. No sooner had, in fact, he gotten the place all set to go, tidied up, than the British come in and take it. Now, why? Well, on the one hand, this was really almost an inevitable development. New England had been expanding downward. People had been moving down along the coast. They were in Virginia. They were expanding upward. So there was this kind of chunk in the middle. Uh, and uh, basically, uh, the uh, king said to his uh, younger brother, um, you know, Jimmy, I got a present for you. Uh, only slight trouble is that the Dutch think that they own it, so you're going to have to take it. When they get there, they train their guns on the city, which is utterly indefensible. But they were very cleverly sent a message and said, listen, tell you what, we won't blow the place to kingdom come, we won't burn it down, we won't rape all the women. In fact, you can keep your language, you can keep your shipping, you can keep everything. All you got to do is switch allegiance. Uh, and why not? You know, where's your loyalty? And in fact, they had no loyalty. Uh, they were interested in commerce and money making. So while Stuyvesant, whose you know, career and job and reputation was on the line, stormed and peg-legged around, uh, in the end, uh, the town gave up without a shot. And they uh, lower the, uh, the Dutch uh, flag and up goes the English flag. By the time Great Britain acquired New York in 1664, 
It was arguably the most diverse city in the North American mainland. I think it goes back to the fact that very few Dutch were willing to come. So what happened was, in this desperate need for people to do the trading, to you know, man the port, to be the, uh, the military and defend the place, uh, they uh, kept opening the doors. So people came, but they came from all over the flotsam and jetsam of the North Atlantic world. So there were dozens of nationalities. And on the streets, there were dozens of languages spoken. It was like a babel already. Add to that the fact that Dutch New York was a center for uh, African Americans or Africans to come to America to be brought as slaves. So you had a rather large black population in early New York City. It was also uh, very diverse with American Indians because you had a variety of groups such as the Iroquois, the Delaware, and a lot of other refugee groups who came from various points to the south and west such as the Shawnees and the Tutelos and Tuscaroras moving through. So it wasn't just a complicated place for European colonists but also for Native Americans. Life in Manhattan didn't change that much after the British takeover. The city continued to grow as a center for international commerce and a magnet for immigrants. And although they no longer owned the island, the Dutch residents still retained a sizable share of wealth and power. After losing his job as the colony's director, Peter Stuyvesant took up farming on the lower east side, east side of Manhattan, Manhattan Island, island on, on an estate, estate known, known as the Bowery. His accented voice became just one among many in the colorful town recently renamed New York. Stuyvesant had resisted the diversification of the colony, protesting the arrival of the first Jews in 1654, who sought asylum from persecution in Brazil. Certainly by comparison to what was happening in Europe, Jews were relatively well received in the 18th century colonies. The law did not treat them well. Jews could not vote. They couldn't hold public office. Uh, they couldn't sit on juries. But their social life was certainly a distinct improvement over what it was in the old world. Most of the Jews who arrived in New York during the colonial period were of Eastern European origin and immigrated in hopes of escaping poverty and persecution. But a few colonial-era Jewish immigrants came from families who had achieved financial success in England. Among these was Jacob Franks. Franks was the son of an English broker, he maintained commercial ties with England, and soon became a successful merchant and a major figure in New York's first synagogue. In 1712, Jacob Franks married Abigail Levy, daughter of another Jewish immigrant. Together, they moved to 81 Pearl Street. In that same building on Pearl Street, William Bradford, an English Quaker, had set up New York's first printing press. Bradford had come to New York in 1691 from Pennsylvania after the authorities there had come down hard on him for a book he had published. In 1725, he began publishing the city's first newspaper, the New York Gazette. Earlier, Bradford had taken on an apprentice 14-year-old John Peter Zinger, a German immigrant. Singer eventually set up his own print shop and began a rival paper, the Weekly Journal. Zinger's paper accused New York's political leadership of corruption, incompetence, influence peddling, election fraud, and tyranny. Zinger was arrested for seditious libel and was imprisoned for 10 months, but in a trial argued by one of the best English lawyers in the colonies, Zinger won his landmark case on the extraordinary grounds that his paper's accusations were true. Freedom of press is not well established in the 18th century. This is an early case in which it is achieved in one trial. And so the Zinger case is a precursor of what becomes one of the fundamental foundation stones of American freedom. But not all residents of colonial New York have the benefit of powerful lawyers to defend their freedoms. In 1699, Mando, a black woman, petitioned the court of Queens County, New York for her daughter's freedom as well as her own. Mando claimed that her former owner had promised to free her at the time of the owner's death. When the courts failed Mando, she escaped from her new owner and fled into Indian territory. American Indians rarely returned escaped slaves. 
In 1705, the New York Assembly passed a law calling for the death of any runaway slave found more than 40 miles north of Albany. Luckily for Mando, she was never found. Soon after the time of Mando's escape, wealthy New Yorkers began to acquire slaves to work as domestic servants. By 1721, Cadwallader Colden, a Scottish doctor, had become sufficiently established to instruct his agent to buy me two Negro men about 18 years of age. Please likewise to buy me a Negro girl about 13 years old. My wife has told me she designs her chiefly to keep the children and to sow. In addition to his work as a doctor, Colden published copiously, including works on ethnography, physics, botany, and history. He also wrote advice to his daughter Elizabeth. Let your dress, your conversation, and the whole business of your life be to please your husband and to make him happy, and you need not fail of being so yourself. Elizabeth's husband was a member of the wealthy Delancey family. The patriarch of this family, Stephen Delancey, was a French Huguenot who had immigrated to New York in 1685 to escape religious persecution. In New York, Stephen Delancey prospered in the mercantile business. He also helped establish New York's French church and served as a member of the state senate. In 1719, he built a large house at the corner of Pearl and Broad Streets that served as a symbol of his prosperity in the New World. The Delancey Mansion was just down the street from the Bradford print shop, which kept its presses busy publishing the works of Cadwallader Colden. The Franks family were neighbors as well, and in due time, the daughter of Abigail Franks eloped with young Oliver Delancey, much to her mother's dismay. Thus did the lives of New York's diverse immigrant communities naturally grow entwined, even as they sought to maintain their cultural identities in the New World. It's striking that, that different ethnic groups do continue to maintain their ethnic identity. And the question is, why? Uh, I think the answer to that question is, first of all, they very much want to, and they, they live together. Uh, they live in communities, whether they're separate communities or separate neighborhoods of small towns or villages or some cities. And secondly, they maintain that uh, kind of identity around language and religion. However, each of those communities is also in constant contact, principally through trade, with other people. And so all of them ultimately are in the process of assimilating and becoming, in a sense, more American. The ethnic diversity of the immigrants who flocked to the Middle Colonies reflected religious diversity as well. The Middle Colonies proved particularly adept at encouraging religious pluralism because all of them, New York, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Delaware, even Maryland, encouraged wide-scale immigration from Europe. And all of those colonies also imported fairly large numbers, indeed surprisingly large numbers, of African slaves. Society moved from one composed primarily of Protestant Englishmen and women, largely centered around the Church of England or dissenting Protestantism, Congregationalism and Presbyterianism, to a society that contained African Americans, Africans who practiced or attempted to practice traditional African rituals, German immigrants, Lutherans, Calvinists, Mennonites, Moravians, French Huguenots. And this society, by the 1750s, made religion in the New World markedly different than it was in any other European society. Willem Covenhoven's ancestors had been in the Middle Colony since his great-great-grandfather, Wolford Covenhoven, had immigrated to New Amsterdam in 1630. By the 18th century, the Covenhovens had moved to New Jersey, where Willem Covenhoven was born. As a child, Covenhoven was surrounded by the language, religion, traditions, diet, and dress of his Dutch ancestors. 
who had kept apart from their English and Scottish neighbors. As a young adult, Copenhagen maintained strong ties with the Dutch Reformed Church. But in the 1720s, as he made plans to build a spacious home on 180 acres of farmland in Monmouth County, he increasingly encountered neighbors with different religious affiliations. Among Covenhoven's neighbors was William Tennant, an Irish Protestant who had come to New Jersey as part of a wave of Scots-Irish immigration that continued through the 18th century and beyond. Disturbed by the version of the Presbyterian Church he found in America, Tennant began preaching independently. In 1746, he established the College of New Jersey, where he hoped to train like-minded ministers. Tennant's detractors called the school the Log College, but eventually it became known as Princeton University. Around the same time, another New Jersey resident, John Woolman, took up a different kind of ministry. Woolman was a devout Quaker and a pioneer of the abolitionist movement. Woolman's convictions were confirmed when, as a young man, he was hired to write a will in which slaves were to be bequeathed. But as I looked to the Lord, he inclined my heart to his testimony. And I told the man that I believed the practice of counting slavery to this people was not right and desired to be excused. Woolman traveled throughout New Jersey, crusading against slavery. And his sermons inspired many Quakers to begin liberating their slaves. Meanwhile, Reverend Tennant collected funds to build a Presbyterian meeting house in Monmouth. One of his large donors was William Covenhoven, whose contribution was recognized with a family pew. In joining this church of British origin, Covenhoven was apparently leaving his Dutch identity behind. The family eventually anglicized their name also. In the graveyard of the old Tennant church, the headstones of the Covenhoven's descendants read Conover. As colonists lived with men and women who thought in ways other than the ways they thought, they learned to think that these people didn't live such bad lives. These people could have legitimate views about the nature of the supernatural, morals and ethics that weren't quite the same as the views that they held. And therefore, they learned through practice to develop notions about the legitimacy and the propriety of religious tolerance. In 1682, William Penn described his colony as a collection of diverse nations, French, Dutch, Germans, Swedes, Danes, Finns, Scotch, and English, and of the last equal to all the rest. Pennsylvania's economy soon grew as diverse as its population. A strong work ethic and a desire to prosper were two things that most colonists, no matter what their ethnic background, had in common. Americans developed their own material culture. On the one hand, they did continue to import wide ranges of goods from the old world society. There's no doubt that that happened. But American woodworkers, furniture makers, clock makers, watchmakers, all developed in the new world. One could find chair makers from Maine to South Carolina, all making widely different varieties of chairs, using local woods, using developing local production techniques. Those cabinet makers could, by the 1750s and 60s, compete in quality of goods with cabinet makers to be found in London. And that occurred in part because of the fabulous economy that was developing. The success of Benjamin Franklin, who rose from a printer's apprentice to become a famous publisher, scientist, and statesman, epitomized the unprecedented opportunity that working white men enjoyed in Pennsylvania. At the working man's house, hunger looks in, but dares not enter. And in 18th century Philadelphia, working women could also find their place. Mary Smith moved to Philadelphia from New Jersey sometime after her father's death in 1737. 
In his will, he had left his daughter five pounds sterling and instructions that she become bound to an appropriate trade. Mary was not yet 18 at the time, but she soon found a way to support herself as a seamstress. In 1762, Mary Smith was able to buy her own home at number 126 Elfrith Alley in Philadelphia. She paid 280 pounds sterling and arranged to buy fire insurance from a company established by Benjamin Franklin. As the occupants of the middle colonies prospered, the population grew. And as in New England and the Chesapeake, increasing numbers of colonists began moving west into Indian lands. Pennsylvania does have a different history than most of the other colonies along the eastern seaboard. That most of those colonies had an Indian war within the first generation or so of their existence. Part of it is William Penn and his vision for the colony and his determination to show respect for the native peoples in the lands that he was moving into. One man who worked to maintain a peaceful frontier was a German immigrant named Conrad Weiser. At age 16, Weiser had settled on the New York frontier with his family, where he immediately made a point to befriend the local Mohawks. Weiser learned the language of all the Iroquois nations and began acting as an intermediary between the German settlers and the Native Americans in the region. In 1729, Weiser moved with his wife and their children into Pennsylvania, settling on 200 acres of farm land in the Susquehanna River Valley. Conrad Weiser is one of those fascinating and almost forgotten figures in American history. Weiser was a spiritual wanderer. He was something of a mystic. He was a local magistrate. He was many things, but I think his central identity was as a go-between, a man who can straddle two worlds, Indian and European, and remain friends and on good terms with both. We think of Indians and Europeans, and they, they either got along or they didn't get along, but there, not much attention is paid to, well, how did they talk to each other? How did they know what to say? How did they know where to go in order to meet the proper people that they needed to say something to? All of these things were the very stock and trade of go-betweens. Go-betweens carried messages between Indian leaders and colonial officials. They helped negotiate trade treaties and land transfers. Perhaps their most crucial work came when they were called on to handle a crisis. A colonist has been killed by unknown Indians in some unknown place on the frontier. Send Conrad Weiser out to investigate this, to find out what happened, to make sure that the Indians aren't too upset, to invite the Indians to a council so that this matter can be settled amicably. European go-betweens didn't operate on their own. Rather, they worked with and through their Native American counterparts. Shekelemy, this Oneida leader, was among the, the go-betweens that Weiser most relied upon, that they were paired for a long time, from about 1730 until Shekelemy's death in 1748. They were seen as a matched set. They were, I think, true friends. They did not, however, see eye to eye on the way America sh should look in the immediate future or in the distant future. Shekelemy was a fascinating figure in his own right. He is a figure who really helped to grease the wheels of intercultural affairs until his death in 1748. It is no coincidence that after Shekelemy died, Conrad Weiser started complaining about how he couldn't figure out what was going on in Indian country. Things began to get very tangled and troubled in relations between Indians and colonists on the Pennsylvania frontier. And when Conrad Weiser died in 1760, the Iroquois too lamented his passing. We are at a great loss and sit in darkness, as since his death we cannot so well understand one another. Most of the continent was Indian country until uh, at least 1800. And so Europeans couldn't simply come in and announce that this was the way things were going to be and expect the Indians to give in to that. They had to work out ways to accommodate one another, and they did so through trade and treaties and other forms of diplomacy. 
But there were limits to this middle ground, I think, even from the beginning, that while they learned to get along, they learned each other's language, they learned how to trade items back and forth, there was still a sense of difference between Indian and European, and it was a sense of difference that became even more pronounced over time. Indians began to say more and more often on the Pennsylvania frontier things such as, I am not as you are, I am of a quite different nature from you. There is a growing identity among Indians as Indian people in contradistinction to uh, European colonists. And I think something similar is happening among those colonists. For all the diversity in colonial America, and especially among the middle colonies, they do begin to see themselves as different from their European cousins and counterparts. Part of American identity was forged in this relationship with Indians, that they began to see themselves as a collective in opposition to the Indians. And so you see two forces, two collective groups here, many, many Indian tribes and many, many different European colonists coming in their relations with the other side to think of themselves more as one people. The ethnic, religious, and economic diversity that flourished in the middle colonies had long-term consequences in the shaping of America. The principal way that diversity has long-term consequences is, on the one hand, it prevents any one group from feeling completely in control of the situation and feeling that they are the sole possessors of whatever it is that America means or that they control everything. So it creates a circumstance of competition and a, a sense that uh, what is at stake is at stake for lots of different people, not just for one. I think if you look at America in the context of the world at the time, in the 18th century or the 19th century, or even today, uh, we live in one of the most uh, diverse and competitive uh, societies in the world. It influences us in every way, I think, and part of that is because there isn't the sense that there is only one group that sets all the rules and makes everything happen and knows what should be done. Those are debatable issues in the United States, and they were debatable in the 18th century.